In this lecture segment, we are talking about early Christian art, or art for Christians during the late antique period, and how it may have been understood by a range of viewers. We are focusing on a group of sculptures and catacomb decoration. We're looking at examples of early Christian art that were made before Christianity became associated with the government, with the Roman Empire. And this is a period when Christianity is still one of these mystery religions and is being practiced on the down low during this period of the multiplicity of religion that we talked about in Dura Europas. Christians at this point repurpose houses to be worship structures. They are not fully institutionalized, they don't have a centralized administration, they are not usually wealthy. So we'll see small portable objects and especially funerary objects and decorations like frescoes and catacombs. As Christian art and architecture emerge, they will develop from the foundation of late antique Roman art and will use the visual traditions, including the style and even the iconography of works of art made for different religions and in the service of empire. Creating an object based on the visual traditions of a different culture and giving it new meaning is called syncretism. We will see that the meaning a viewer extracts from a work of art is due to his or her context as a viewer, religion, life experience, and even social class. So as a first foray into exploring syncretism, let's talk about this group of objects called the Jonah marbles. These five sculptures tell the story of Jonah, an Old Testament story that was part of both Jewish and Christian traditions. A quick summary of the story. God commanded the prophet Jonah to go and preach to the city of Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go, tried to run away by boat, ended up getting swallowed by a whale, spat up by the whale, prayed in gratitude, and then rested under a vine after preaching to Nineveh as instructed by a deity. Each of these sculptures presents a scene from the story of these four. But then this fifth sculpture depicts a young man holding a sheep. Now these objects seem like a good match with the Jonah story. If a Jew looked at this grouping, that is probably what he would understand, that this is the story of Jonah. A Christian would probably understand it about the same, but would read the young man holding the sheep as Christ as the good shepherd. But what about an adherent of the Roman state religion? How would that person understand these sculptures? How could these objects be read differently by different people? Well, let's look at these two. For a Jew or a Christian, the one on the left could be Jonah reflecting on his experience under a gourd vine, but for an adherent of the Roman state religion, it could be Endymion, a character from Greek mythology who is loved by a moon goddess, and she convinces Jupiter to give him eternal youth by making him sleep forever. So for a Christian, Jonah, for a Roman adherent, Endymion, because that person had no context for understanding this figure as Jonah. And here you see an orant figure on the right, or a figure with arms raised in prayer. Orant means praying in Latin. This is a motif common in multiple religions and could be understood as a praying figure by a pagan, a Jew, or a Christian, but had no specific religious context without the viewer bringing his or her religious background to bear on the sculpture. We also see this with the sculpture of the young man with the sheep. For Christians, this would be Christ as the Good Shepherd. As we saw at Dura Europis, our earliest known images of Christ are of him as the Good Shepherd, and would be a reminder of Christ caring for the flock, his followers. But for a pagan, an adherent of the Roman pantheon, this could be any number of young male deities. The god of wine, Dionysus, as a beardless youth, Apollo, or Orpheus. It could be a figure related to having a happy pastoral afterlife, and could express hope for a peaceful existence after death. A young male figure holding a sheep over his shoulders is an old motif that existed long before Christianity, as you see in this sculpture depicting the god Hermes, who according to myth speedily brought a ram to use as a sacrifice so that he could save a town from a plague. The motif of the shepherd connoted comfort and safety and watchfulness as a shepherd cares for his flock. But this iconography takes on new meaning in a Christian context. It is an example of syncretism, borrowing an image from a different tradition and giving it a new meaning. Depending on the viewer's context, the sculpture would have a different iconography and a different meaning or function. We see this multiplicity and flexibility in meaning or function and determining iconography when we deal with catacomb decoration. There are many catacombs, underground tunnels used, by, used as cemeteries for burying ashes and then later bodies outside of the walls of Rome. Burials occurred outside of the city walls because it was considered unsanitary to bury within the walls. They would have niches in the sides where bodies would be placed and then sealed with plaster or stone. Spaces were often painted and so catacombs are the primary site for early Christian art. 
They were not worship spaces, house churches were worship spaces. Instead, they were funerary spaces and could also be used to have a family meal in conjunction with a funeral. In a catacomb, you'll find burials of Jews, pagans, and Christians, as families were not necessarily one religion or the other. Often, people from different religions could be in the same family. In the decoration, we find that the visual language and iconography are so similar that we often cannot tell if the person buried in a particular room was from a certain religion. The decoration needed to be innocuous enough and flexible enough to be suitable for a range of persons. So, for example, scholars today have identified the iconography in this room as depicting the labors of Hercules, but the images were likely flexible enough for an audience during this period. We see a big strong guy, could be Samson for a Jew or a Christian, or could be Hercules for a Roman adherent, a pagan. And the peacocks could be symbols of eternal life for a Christian, or could be symbols of the goddess Juno for a pagan. We also see this in the depiction of the Good Shepherd from a catacomb. This is a ceiling fresco with a central round section called a medallion, and then surrounding lunettes or half moon shapes. The Good Shepherd is depicted in the medallion, but there's nothing overtly Christian about it. It signified goodness, goodness and protection, but the specific way a viewer understood it was based on their context as viewers. We have Jonah stories and the lunettes around the edges, right through here. There's the boat, there's the vine, there's the whale. And we also have Orant figures, or figures with their arms raised in prayer, an iconography familiar to pagans, Jews, and Christians. So we have another work of art that could be understood differently by different viewers, depending on their context, what they believed and what they had experienced. Early Christian art provides interesting case studies in how the meaning of a work of art can be different for different people, and teaches us about the flexibility of iconography that allowed for viewers' understanding of imagery to change depending on their context.